Um, what I want to do in this paper is really to um, show you uh, a rather unusual burial that we excavated from a, a late Romano British burial ground and to give you some very preliminary thoughts we've been having about um, how we might interpret this, this, this rather unusual burial. Um, the site I want to uh, talk about is uh, Stanick, which is in Northamptonshire in the English East Midlands. And it's down here um, just next to the River Neen, which is a major watercourse in that area. Um, the Stanick excavations were part of a whole series of excavations done on sites in the general area of Rawns. And it goes under the rubric of the Rawns Area Project. So it's looking at archaeology at a variety of different places uh, in that particular locale. Um, Another site there that I will be mentioning briefly uh, lies just on the other side of the river at Great Addington. So I'll be referring to that a little bit as, as time goes on. Now at Stanick, um, there was um, a multi-phase occupation, um, but I want to concentrate uh, on the late Roman period um, at that site. Um, so on the left here, we have a plan of some of the late Roman features so what we have towards the right-hand side is a great slew of occupation features, uh, ditches, outlines of houses, pits, etc. Um, but in addition to this occupation evidence, we also have a small cemetery uh, off to this side here. Um, 35 burials in the cemetery. Um, normative burial at this period was obviously supine extended, and that's the way most of those burials are but we've also got a handful of what we might call deviant burials. Um, five of these are decapitations, and uh, in addition to those is also the one that I'm, I'm going to talk about. Um, so on the right side here, we have a plan of the cemetery. So we've got the main concentration of graves here, and these non-normative burials tend to be more on the outskirts of the cemetery rather than sort of in the midst of most of the burials. So the one I want to talk about um, is this one over to the side here. So this is the burial. Um, so top left is the site photograph, obviously. Um, the skeleton is fairly complete. We've lost the, the lower legs and the feet, though, unfortunately, to machining. Um, but other than that, we, we've got a fairly complete and reasonably well-preserved well burial. Um, so we can see straight away it's a, a, what we might call a deviant burial, a non-normative burial. So this chap is buried face down. Um, and um, we also have uh, the left arm passes in front of the body and uh, the wrists lie fairly close together. So this raises the possibility that uh, the hands may have been bound together. Um, although the, given the position of the body, that, that's not quite certain. This kind of position may also reflect things like rigor mortis. Uh, so we can't be absolutely sure of that. Um, if we have a look at the photograph at the top left, we can see that... Um, there is a, a flat stone wedged in the mouth and it's clamped quite tightly be between the teeth there. Um, we wondered whether it could have got down to this position somehow through natural taphonomic factors. Um, but we thought this was pretty unlikely. We couldn't see a way in which it sort of end up in this position so tightly between the jaws uh, fortuitously. And it seemed much more likely to us that it was um, placed in that position when the individual was buried. So what we decided to do, we decided to block lift the skull and to excavate it in the laboratory so we could learn more about the exact position of, of this stone. So bottom right there, we've got the same kind of a view but taken in the laboratory, again showing this um, bluish flat stone here. And uh, bottom left is, as the excavation in the laboratory proceeds, we've removed the mandible and we can see that this flat stone uh, occupies most of the anterior part of the oral cavity. Um, one thing we look into at the moment is whether the stone was, de the stone was deliberately shaped to fit that or whether it was fortuitous and um, they simply picked a stone that, that would fill a gap, so to speak. Um, to my eyes, some of the broken edges look rather fresher than others and so it may have been deliberately fashioned to fit that uh, but we need that to be confirmed by somebody who knows rather more about geoarchaeology than, than I do. 
as this is a tag conference, I ought to say something about epistemology in interpreting this burial. Um, we took a biocultural approach to understanding this individual. So what that means is we have privileged explanations for this burial that simultaneously explain both the cultural and the skeletal evidence, the osteological evidence. And taking that kind of approach is also consistent with the philosophical principle of Occam's razor. So in other words, we are privileging explanations that explain the totality of the evidence over explanations that cherry-pick different factors to try and explain different parts of the evidence piecemeal. Okay? So that was the kind of philosophical and theoretical approach that, that we took. So I'm going to kind of break with scientific convention at this point and give you my explanation first, and then I shall backtrack and give you the evidence upon which we, we, we base this explanation. And then at the end of all that, you can decide um, whether or not you, you, you believe my explanation. So what, well, what is my interpretation then of this burial? What, what did we think about this? So our interpretation is that the, so, the stone in the mouth is the symbolic replacement for a tongue that was amputated in life. So what led us to... What suggested this interpretation to us? Well, what suggested this was that we knew, knew of other burials in cemeteries of similar dates where severed body parts were replaced by objects. So that's what sort of gave us this idea. Um, there aren't very many of these. Um, we're still kind of combing through the literature to try and find more examples. But we found ten cases in Britain where you have this sort of phenomenon. In nine cases, these are decapitations, where the head has been severed, and uh, in place of the head at atop the shoulders is some kind of an object. Usually this is a stone or a ceramic vessel, and we've got five cases uh, of each of these. But in one of, in, in one of these um, ten examples, we've got uh, uh, somebody with a severed foot, where the severed foot seems to be replaced by an object in the correct anatomical position in the grave. Um, five of these ten cases come from Northamptonshire, um, We've got two in the other burials from this Stanick site. We've also got three burials from that Great Addington site, which is just across the river. Now, Great Addington is a little bit later. It's an antiquarian intervention, so it's hard to be certain of the date. But in the way they talk about the grave goods, it seems to be an early Saxon rather than a late Roman site. Um, so it's quite interesting that in this kind of phenomenon we, where we have replacement of severed body parts, there seems to be a concentration of these cases in a, a, a particular location and if we had, do have this difference in date between Stanick in the late Roman period and Great Addington in the Saxon period it seems to be a local tradition that had a, a, a lifetime of, 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 of several centuries potentially OK, so let's have a look at some of these examples we'll have a look first at some that don't come from Northamptonshire um, let's have a look at some other cases uh, so on the left here we have a, uh, a burial of an adult male from Oxfordshire um, we have the uh, severed head down here, it's a decapitation with the head placed uh, between the, the feet there. And in place of the head, we have a vessel here. This is fragmented, but it seems like this was uh, buried as a whole vessel placed in that anatomical position. The right-hand one is the only case we've been able to look at so far, the only case we've come across so far, where the severed part isn't a head, in this case it's a foot. So we have this kind of semi-prone burial. Uh, this comes from Cambridgeshire. Um, again, this is an adult male. And I haven't been able to chase down an osteological report on this skeleton, but the site report says that the left foot had been severed and um, the pot that you see at the end of the left leg was a, a replacement in some sense for, the, for, for that missing foot. Let's turn to some of the Stanick cases. And we've got um, about five decapitations, as I think I said, uh, amongst those 35 burials. And in two of these, we've got replacement of the severed head by a stone. <coughs> so in this left-hand example here, quite a well-preserved skeleton, we've got the, uh, the, 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 the skull, cranium, the mandible, and the top few cervical vertebrae um, placed at the feet. And you've got this large, flat stone sitting where the head ought to be. 
and we've got another example here with a slightly smaller stone. This isn't so well preserved, but you might be able to pick out that you've got a fragmentary cranium here and the mandible and some cervical vertebrae were there as well. So here the head has been severed and placed over the abdomen. So the fact that in some stanic burials you have this replacement of a missing body part by a stone led us to think, well, maybe the missing body part in our burial is the tongue, and that's why the stone's in the mouth. So if we're right, what might, might we expect to see when we come to look at the bones? Well, if the severing of the tongue was a perimortal event, you might expect to see knife marks, uh, perhaps on the hard palate or on the internal surface of the mandible. Well, we had a look for these and there weren't any. If the tongue was severed sometime during the life of the individual and they survived that event, um, then we might expect to see evidence for infection. And the thing we really might expect to see on the bones is new bone forming on existing bone surfaces. That's a classic bony response to infection. And we would expect to get that if the tongue was severed. Our, mouth are teeming with, our mouths are teeming with bacteria, and so uh, an, an infection would, would have been almost inevitable, I think. And when we had a look at the mandible, we did, in, did, did indeed see a periosteal reaction. Now, these periosteal reactions are really hard to show on the slides, unfortunately. I took an awful lot of photographs with different lighting angles and that. And I don't think I've been particularly successful at, at showing this, so you have to kind of take my word for it if you can't see it very well. So this is the left side of the mandible. This is the internal medial surface here. And um, this sort of pitted area here, um, and running under here as well, is this deposit of new bone. Normally that bone surface is smooth, so that pitting is abnormal. So we do have a periosteal deposit of new bone there. We can perhaps see a little bit clearer on the outer surface of that left side of the mandible. So you've got pitting in this area here, and just up here, um, I think the bone must have been cleaned with a toothbrush rather enthusiastically at the post-X stage because the new bone has flaked off just there and you can see perhaps a slightly pitted surface of the normal bone uh, underneath it. Um, when we look at periosteal reactions, we try and see how remodelled the bone is because that gives us a history of the lesion, as it were. And when we looked at this, there was some areas of bone that looked fairly freshly laid down just before death and some areas that were quite well remodelled. So this is a, a, a lesion with, with, with a time depth to it. And so if this did follow the, the, the severing of the tongue, there must have been a, a period, some period, maybe weeks or so, I don't know, between the severing of the tongue and the death of the individual. Time for this bony reaction to occur. <coughs> now, of course, when you get an infection like this, there's every chance that um, you'll get it spread to other parts of the skeleton through the bloodstream. And this gives a distribution of the periosteal reactions that we found when we looked at the whole skeleton. So they've got this sort of concentration in the mandible. We also see it in other parts of the skeleton. It's kind of fairly randomly dotted around. So if we're right, it may be that it's kind of simply spread by septicemia to other bits of the skeleton. And it may well have been that septicemia that, it, that killed this, this, this particular individual. So let's acquaint us, uh, ourselves with some facts about tongue amputation. Um, we may be looking at a punitive scenario, perhaps e uh, echoing some of the ones that Howard described in the last paper. Um, in some historical societies, um, removal of the tongue was um, a punishment for individuals who'd, whose utterances had offended maybe a ruling elite, or they can be a punishment for people who make malicious accusations against other members of the society. Um, and if we are uh, correct in saying that the position of the hands in the grave suggests a tied body, then that may support this, this punitive scenario. Um, what we're doing at the moment is having a look through the classical literature to see whether this kind of punishment, uh, that there's any documentary evidence for it occurring in the western fringes of the Roman Empire that would sort of support this particular interpretation. The other place we look for, for for inspiration as regards interpretation is the forensic literature on tongue amputation. Um, usually, amputation of the tongue is self-inflicted. It's people who bite through their tongues. It's not normally something that's the result of assault or something like that. Um, you tend to get minor oral injuries in people who suffer epileptic fits or in some neurological conditions like Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's <coughs> disease. 
Um, but they don't tend to lead to a completely severed tongue if you look at the, the, the forensic literature. Um, so I think if we're correct, we're looking at a rather more severe type of neurological mental illness. Um, so today it tends to happen to people who uh, suffer from things like schizophrenia or people who abuse hallucinogenic drugs. Um, on this left side here, we um, see the tongue of a schizophrenic patient um, who in a psychotic episode amputated his own tongue by biting it off. Um, we see another patient uh, on this side and they've tried to reattach his tongue. As you can see, it's kind of still rotting away, so it hasn't been very successful in that, in that instance. So let's think back to the way the burial was in the ground. It was a prone burial, a non-normative burial in, in that sense. Um, people have discussed at great length the meaning of prone burials <coughs> in, in, at, at this particular period. Um, but one kind of strand that's fairly consistent is that these are deviant burials that may reflect deviant behaviour in the people who suffered these types of burials. And so if we're, if we're right in this interpretation, if we tend towards the forensic interpretation of somebody who was severely mentally ill, then that may also explain why he was a prone burial, why he was buried in a different way in that sense from the rest of the population. His behaviour may, be, may have been seen as deviating from the social norms, and therefore he deserved a deviant burial. So our conclusions are, well, the kind of thing that we're talking about, this idea that we've got a severed tongue, and this is a symbolic, the stone is a symbolic replacement in the mouth, is a biocultural interpretation. And a good biocultural interpretation should accord with both the biological and the cultural evidence. And we would argue that our explanation appears to do this. But it's certainly something I wouldn't want to sort of push too dogmatically. Um, as a scientist, I'm always uncomfortable when one builds interpretation on top of interpretation, a kind of teetering pile, and I kind of have the impression this is, this is what we're doing here. So as a scientist, this makes me feel slightly nervous. Um, and indeed, one can think of other explanations for the evidence that, that are perfectly possible. Uh, and so therefore, I offer these conclusions as something that's very tentative and something that's a, a basis for discussion, rather than something that I really want to be very dogmatic about. Thank you for your attention.